All right, let's get going. We got one hour before lunch. I just came on a four hour ice covered uh, from Northeast Iowa, so I'm a little bit tense. I'm gonna warm up with you guys right now. Today we're gonna talk about conservation practices that can be used in sloping lands. Now, why would they ask a flatlander to talk about sloping lands? I farmed with some of the flattest dirt in Northeast Iowa. Well, because I'm also involved with land improvement contractors, so we do a lot of structures. So we put a lot of structures in, and a lot of things I talk about can be used not just in sloping lands, but we can use them in flat land also. Let me give you a little background. So the background, people don't know me, Tim Rucker live in Arlington, it's far northeast Iowa, three hours north and east of here. Corn and soybean farmer raised seed corn for Bayer, Monsanto. I'm the past president of the Iowa Corn Growers, also um, past chairman of Land Improvement Contractors. And if you haven't heard of Land Improvement Contractors, they're the guys, the association of dirt movers, structure builders, they put conservation structures on agriculture land. I've been kind of involved with cover crops since 2013. I've the short story was I'm a tillage guy that got converted with cover crop. So part of the things you're going to see some cover crop uh, information. I put this on just because I used it one other time and I thought this is, you know, I know you guys are getting enough credits for this. I thought, well, we can throw in a little, a little seriousness. Good farmers who take seriously their duties as stewards of creation and of their land inheritors, their lands inheritors, contribute to the welfare of society in more ways than society usually acknowledges or even knows. These farmers produce valuable goods, of course, but they also conserve soil, conserve water, they conserve wildlife, they conserve open space, they conserve scenery. So I just, I'd like to start out because I think that's a great description of, of what we're looking at today. I'm gonna bump through some of these really quickly. The only thing I wanted to point out with this is it just gives a nice timeline of where we were with conservation and agriculture. There's some major things. Um, 19, or 1837, the plow, you know, not, um, soil conservation service was created. The biggest thing, and I don't have to help, I have a pointer. I started farming right here, 1985. Conservation cost share was started. It was started for the reason to because in Iowa, we had 20 tons of soil loss per acre per year, on average, 1985. 30 years later, we have five acre, or five tons of soil loss per acre per year. Now that's a lot of soil, but we went from 20 tons to five tons. Now it's taken us 30 years, but it's, it was quite a feat. And part of it was because we had combination of cost share, government programs, along with state programs to help put structures on the ground to stop soil movement. You know, no-till was already was, 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 uh, popular in the 70s. It got more popular through the 80s. But now, I want to look at right here, 2013, 14, 15. We could add another line there because I think we are on a soil health revo uh, revolution. We've started taking our focus maybe away from conservation, away from structures, and talk about soil health. So I want to get into that a little bit. Yeah, we don't need to talk about that. That's just some more background. So soil health. I got asked to do a presentation for a local professor. They said, thought, oh, I'm a farmer, you know, I've done some talks. She says, uh, I said, what do you want to talk about? What do you want me to talk about? She said, soil health. And I'm thinking, I've been farming for 32 years. I don't know the first thing about soil health. I knew nothing. I really, and so I had to do, start doing some research. So soil health, by definition, and you read it, continued capacity to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So why is it important? We know why it's important. You know, increases yield, increased profit, preserves soil and water biodiversity, build resilience, and that's really more important today than ever before, and improve utilization and retention of nutrients. Everything that's in you guys' wheelhouse is right here. 
So this was the one slide that came to me and I'm like, oh, that's what soil health was. I must have missed that in soils class in college. So physical, chemical, biological components, right? Physical, that's the thing, you know, I, we have land, we know what we need to do, we know when we should be tilling it, we know about compaction, we know about texture, that's a, that's a farm, you own land, you understand that. Nutrients, probably a lot of the people in this room understand the nutrients really well. We know we need to have, you know, N, P, and K, we know we have to have good pH, we need to know all those things that's up in that um, upper right circle, and you guys are the best at doing them. But what about the biological part? So I explain it this way. You guys have helped me be successful in farming because you kept the top four inches of my soil just in perfect condition. You guys balanced the nutrients in that thing, no problem. With the help of our seed companies, they've been able to create this plant that can put on 240 bushels of yield no matter what the weather is. We know everything about that corn plant. We know it because we've mapped the genome in corn. We know everything about it. But what we really don't know is the two feet that's below us. That's the part that's just starting to, at least in my mind, starting to become unlocked. So that's the part, the biological part, is the part I think we need to really pay, pay attention to. So uh, what affects soil health, and so we can talk about that. Uh, you know, we know tillage, chemical, biological. I'm gonna run through some of these. Um, so there's a farm next to me that hasn't been farmed in 50 years. Uh, some of you guys know where it is. Um, I took a spade out there because I was doing a, a shoot with um, Farm Journal to look at different soil types. And this is this picture. I took the spade, put it in the ground, I put pushed on it, and it just about went out of my hands and out of sight. I went just. This wasn't a fence row either. This was on, on the farm that hasn't been, and I went about four steps over to a farm that I'm farming, and I could barely get the spade in the ground an inch. And I wish I'd have had the picture of what that compared to this. So I, I put that in my collection because I would love to replicate this type of soil on my, uh, my working ground. So I added this one because this is the newest thing. Uh, you know, and it's important to know, you probably heard it already, I might be repeating, but there's more living organisms in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on Earth, about six billion. So we hear in the news all the time about, oh, we got this six billion mouths to feed, you know, agriculture's gonna have to step up, we got all these people to feed. We got six billion mouths to feed in every teaspoon of soil. Are we feeding them? Are we feeding those nutrients? I mean, there's six billion in that big a piece. We got a lot more mouths to feed that's right below us. That's my point. So, soil health, what can it do? How can it help? Oh, did I go the wrong way? No. Nope. So, I want to talk a little bit about 4R because some of the guys said, let's talk about 4R because 4R is, 4R plus, is the system that I hope we can all encompass to say, you know what, with this system, with your um, knowledge on soil health, your knowledge on chemicals, the farmer's knowledge that we've come together with some good conservation practices and improve yield, improve um, health of our soil and our water. Because it's a big, it's, it's a huge issue. You can't help but open up a magazine and see it. So you guys have probably already seen it several times. This, this is the 4R system. So it's the right, the right source, the right time, the right rate, right place. I mean, perfect sense. Then you add the plus, and the plus adds the conservation practices. Who is better in this room, besides maybe a contractor, or maybe if you're with NRCS, who is better and works with the farmer more directly about his inputs on, his, on that particular piece of ground than the people sitting right here? So you're already, in, you're already telling them about fertilizer chemical <coughs> programs, you know everything about it, you educate yourself about it, I know in the last two years that I've been here, you're talking more about cover crops, but can we help make that bridge and start identifying with your customer, which is, if it's your farm, farmer people, farmers, can we start making that connection? Hey, do we have a piece of soil, a piece of, of 
land that every year that I'm doing yield maps for you, every year that we're grid sampling, this <coughs> ground is, you just tell it's not working out. Let's figure out something to do with that. Does that happen? I mean, does that happen in your daily, if you're out there working with farmers, does that kind of conversation happen? Because I don't know if it does. Jeff's shaking his head, so it does happen. So you kind of can tell. So I'd like to, that would be great if you, because you guys are out there, you guys are running across doing custom work on my ground. If I can, if I am not seeing something that I could use some help on, you're just an extra arm in my, uh, in my operation. <clears throat> So I'll give you a, so some examples, and that's this thing was titled to you know some of the things we can do on sloping land. I got some great pictures off the the for our website. So contour buffer strips, ponds, terraces, wetlands. None of these are new to people, but as you think about where things can, I guess let me let me take it back. When we think about the amount of dollars that are going to go into conservation in the future in Iowa, I think if you're particular piece of ground or you can help a farmer make um, a switch to do something that he's not already doing in the name of conservation. Maybe it's putting a structure in. Maybe it's spending some money putting a structure in. There's going to be dollars to really help promote it. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, making a, a recommendation on, um, on plain uh, cover crops. Maybe it's just you know what, we're here to help you. We got the equipment, we can help uh, plant, we can help terminate because we have the equipment to do that. Maybe that's where, the, where you step in. But somewhere along the line, we have to have the conversation. Just some more examples. And I didn't say at the beginning, but if you have any questions, we'll have them at the end, but if you have some burning question, feel free to just yell it out or, or stop me. So here's a couple other edge of field practices that are really popular. And I, I might add because I've, Grew up through a with a grandfather and a, and a father that tiled. The first thing in my mind, whether you're in hilly conditions or you're in flatland, the first thing that I, and this is Tim Recker's opinion, maybe not everybody's, but in order to be able to be successful in all these conservation practices, you first need to have that ground well tiled up. Now that's true in my area, maybe not true in every area, and maybe not true in the real rolling topography. But I think that drainage tile can be a tremendous benefit to you that you can add on to several things if you have drainage tile. Now, on the other end, what, what does drainage tile create? It creates a nexus with that stream, a connectivity that we can get nutrients in that stream quicker, depending on Mother Nature. I, um, I was trying to think of the number, I think. You guys probably tell me, Joel, or <coughs> tell me if I'm wrong. There's like 1,500 pounds of available nitrogen, you guys know this, in, a, in an acre of soil. It's, it's there all the time. Is that right? In the, within the, um, you know, the organic matter, there's 1,500 pounds, but it's in different areas of being able to be utilized by the plant. Does that sound right to you guys, or am I wrong? It's all right, I heard this, and I want to throw it to you guys. I, so there's about 1,500 pounds in our black, highly organic soils. I add about 180 pounds of nitrogen, and I split apply that over three times. I was just at a conference, and they were just jumping on me how, man, I, farmers need to pay for the, they need to be taxed for nitrogen because of the groundwater. What's going on in this groundwater? All the nitrogen is leaving. But there's a lot of nitrogen that's naturally occurring in our soils that Mother Nature has control of when that gets released. Can we all agree on that? Am I? Because I can't lie in this group because there's guys from my hometown that'll be here and say, yeah, I'm, I'm full. But to me, if I'm adding 180 pounds of nitrogen and I'm doing it over three times, that's actually trying, I'm trying to be, you put it on when that plant needs it. But if there's a whole bunch in that soil and Mother Nature says, well, I'm, it's dry this year, she doesn't release a lot of nitrogen. We get a lot of rain, we get a lot of nitrogen in our, in our streams. So I just, I want to make that point so we understand that nitrogen's elusive, it's highly volatile, and we try to do everything we can to, our job is to try to do everything we can to uh, keep it uh, available for the plant and not lose it in the atmosphere. So another, I, I put this slide in when I was talking to groups just because um, I had people that were saying, well, 
you were a tillage guy, you do all this tillage, you still got mow board plows, my uncle's still mow board plow. And so they said, you don't do it, you're not really a conservationist, you don't really do stuff with conservation. And so this was about five years ago, I started listing in my farm operation all the things that I do. All the things that I do, and I would encourage this to be another conversation with your, with your partners, with your farmers, to start making that list. So that when there's a time when maybe people are going to ask for that list, that you have it down, and maybe, I even thought of this, maybe it's such a thing as your fertilizer and chemical cooperator, maybe you help map those structures. I mean, it's pretty easy to do. You guys got the technology. You know, if you have a FSA map, um, that shows buffer strips and everything, but you could actually make a really cool map for a farmer and say, hey, this is where your saturated buffer is. This is where your terraces are. This is where your prep wetland. You know, label the structures and, and put value into it and maybe have that included in, into uh, some type of portfolio the farmer can keep. But anyway, these are all mine. So I have saturated buffers, grass, waterways. I, have, I did have two terraces in Northeast Iowa. I now have one just because one was short and I took it out. I do have a wetland, a CP27 and 28. Um, I have grass buffer strips, conservation tillage, and cover crops, so I, I do tillage, but I also have cover crops. I do precision nutrient placement, so we try to put, we try to place nutrients at the time when the plant needs it. Um, quail buffers and pollinators, uh, I have several little pollinators, two acre pieces um, in five different locations. I do have a water control structure, a couple of them and then, of course, drainage tile, and then soon to be built a crop wetland that I'm working on getting, um, getting some approval on to put in um, a fairly large crop wetland, which will be one of the first in Fayette County if it happens. So 4R Plus, you know, this is going back to what 4R Plus, you know, it, it needs dollars and cents. I mean, it, this is the cooperation between taking, you know, the 4Rs with conservation. So healthy soil, we know that it retains nutrients and moisture. Um, you know, we know that generate, uh, we don't, I don't have to read this to you, but we can increase the value of the land. If I can take, then this, I don't know, maybe you've got to get to an age when it starts to really sink in. You don't think about it when you're younger years of farming. You just think about running, you know, green machinery and turning everything black. But if I can increase one-tenth of one percent of organic matter in my soil every year, or better, and I can go from 3%, 3 to 4%, and I go to 5% over the next 10 years. Hopefully I got 10 years of left farming. That would be a great feat. I think that's what should be our goal. Our goal, instead of saying, well, we need to have this much P, this much K, we need, maybe our goal, and we, that's, those are goals we gotta have, but maybe our next goal with the customer should be, how do we increase, how do we increase your, organic material in your soil. Because we know if we got to increase organic material, you've got to increase water bowling capacity, you have to increase um, um, root, or it, it won't be so compacted, there's, it's going to have um, water infiltration uh, increase. So there's going to be a lot of things that, that happen if we can do that. So maybe that's the conversation we need to have. And so I'm going to keep moving because I know where time is going to, we're going to get away from this. So this one's got a lot of stuff on, but the last, this was off the 4R's website about nutrient stewardship practices, but the last one I think is important. Framework encourages discussion between farmers and crop advisors about improving fertilizer management practices. That's the point I want to make. I, I just made it, but I just thought I'd put it back in the writing. So now I'm going to kind of transition a little bit. Um, and some of the things that I'm doing, because i got pictures of what I'm doing in uh, <coughs> somewhat implementing for our systems. So this is this is a cereal rye that I've been planting 15 inch rows. Um, of course this was in 2017, we had great weather. My rye does not look, did not look like this this fall because it got planted all in uh, November. But this was uh, fall seed, after seed corn. So seed corn comes out in September. Uh, 15 inch rows and then, I'll, then uh, I think I got a picture. I'll just go back into it in the springtime of the year. And I plant into, that's my, me planting into rye. I call it thigh high rye. I plant into it. Um, you can see right here, 
this is exactly where the seed um, trench is, right there. So I never move a rye plant. I actually really like it. You can, you, with the technology we have today, you can plant the rye with RTK. You can plant your beans with RTK. You never have to move a rye plant. And then I terminate the rye. Sometimes a day before I plant, but I'm really getting to where I like to terminate after, after planting. So it's working the best. Um, biggest thing with this, first year I tried it, probably is this, the psychological part. And somewhat when my parents were looking out their window and I'm, you know, I own the farm outside their door and they're wondering, they get to go to the coffee shop, says, what's Tim doing? Is he, is he not farming this year? Because, the, you know, the ride's really tall. So you get a lot of social pressure, but you got a lot of mind pressure also of, of as you're changing your conservation plan, you need people who can help mentor you, take you through those times when you're like, oh, am I doing the right thing? And, you know, and, and the, the people in your position can be those mentors to kind of help farmers because it, there's been success in tillage my whole life. My, my, my father had success in tillage. My grandfather had success in tillage. I'm the one that's taking tillage away and, and I'm trying to mainstream it in my area. I'm trying to mainstream less tillage. This is the hardest thing that's coming in the way of it is right here, is the mindset that you can do it, you can be successful. We're not gonna allow, you know, we don't want to have a yield, a lower yield, we want to have higher yields because of it. And there's certain management things that have to take place to have that make that happen. Jim, do you yeah. do you plant cover crops before corn too? I tried it this year, or in 18, for the first time. Uh, 30 acres off the highway so nobody sees it, of course. Maybe you hide it back by a tree line. It worked great. The, the rye, I'll have to admit, was only um, less than six inches when I terminated. But um, we went in, and, and I think some of the secrets, to me, to plant um, rye, and to plant corn into rye, I think there's a couple secrets. One is, um, that rye does a great job of tying up all the nitrogen in the soil, so you know there's no nitrogen there. In fact, if you guys have access to Soil Scan 360, that might be another. I've thought about this on the way down. Maybe we take some samples of that rye that's just been terminated, and, and I don't, I'm venturing in your area now, but what would be wrong if we take some samples, find out how bad that, I mean, how there's, there's no nitrogen in that soil. We're going to be planting that corn, so what's that tell you as a farmer? You need to get nitrogen on it ahead of time, and then you better have a pretty good dose of nitrogen on the planter. That's what, in my mind, you need a dose of nitrogen on the planter so that you can have nitrogen right there, right by the roots when it's available. And the third thing is, in my area, if you don't put two ounces of pyrethroid into that, you'll have army worm and you won't have corn. You don't have to worry about corn. That's my area. When I, Every year that I plant in the thaw high ride, if the army worms love to lay their eggs and that stuff, two ounces of pyrethroid at the time when you um, terminate the rye, that's all it needs. You don't need to, you don't need something that lasts for 21 days. All you need to do is kill what's there, and it works great. So those are the tricks. So did I answer your question? Or I kind of got on a little rant, but I did do corn, and the yields were just as good as what I expect, better than I expected off this piece of ground. But there is challenges. There is challenges to it. Um, just not, so here's a picture. Just a, so I put a saturated buffer in this year, and it's not a great picture, but um, it's located right here. So I'm. I'm. This is the stream. Uh, actually, Highway Three goes that way. This is uh, City <coughs> Avenue, and I located here, and I put. A tile line that goes 800 and some feet. This was an 8 inch tile with a lot of flow on it. I'm diverting almost 100% of the water. They're testing it. I've had some tremendous results, at least they're telling me it's trem tremendous results of what that saturated buffer is doing. So it's one of the first ones in Fayette County. Pretty proud of that. With the help of, of these, the group, Iowa Corn, Iowa Farm Bureau, and the Iowa Cattlemen, or Fayette County Cattlemen, um, they help sponsor the entire thing and we actually did a demonstration and showed how they're easily they can be put in. Just I'll just say one quick thing as I go through them. Um, they're simple to install, they're not very costly, 
Um, they can be put just about everywhere. This shows it actually working. You, actually, this one's a little oversaturated. I got, I really got too much water on it, and you can see that I got water that's actually kind of boiling out here. But I have about 80 feet before it gets into the stream, and so if the water gets away, it just kind of goes back and reabsorbs back into the uh, ground. But they're easy to install, fairly simple, and. $3,000 go a long ways, and they're great summer projects for contractors. And they can be put into a lot of places. I shouldn't say everywhere, but there's a lot of, they're pretty versatile. Just some more pictures of it. Then I want to just talk, just show you a few pictures. So I think about how, how my farm has changed. So there's my, there's the home farm. And this was, I took it off Google in where, 94? Yeah, 94. And uh, you know this is a pretty good sized stream along. I don't know if that thing works. No, there's a fairly good stream that comes through from there all the way down, continues on. There was little or no buffer, pretty much driveway. Um, had a 20 acre. We called it the peat bed, and that's way up here in this corner. So that's something that you learned how to farm a peat bed. You got stuck. Somebody got stuck there every year. So whoever was going to drive the tractor, probably the first time they filled it. You didn't know how to react in the peat bed. You were going to be in problems. Once we had our yield monitors, we found out we were putting the same nutrients on that ground as we did the rest of the ground. Uh, yields were a lot less. When I bought the farm, I turned it into that. So I put it into a CP2728, took it out, and a short story about that, uh, when I bought the farm in 96, my dad had spent his entire life as he's a contractor, tiling that thing every 30 feet. We were going to drain that piece of ground, no matter what took place. And we drained, and we had tile everywhere in it. And when I installed this thing, we had to tear some of that mop and cap them off, and he was up there. Man, he was not happy, because he had worked his entire life to improve that. And I was just mucking it up for him. About 10 years later, or less than 10 years later, after it's the, we got things planted and a lot of things, we, had, we have a buffer around the outside. So CP27 is the, we got five acres of wetland, and I think there's 10 acres around the outside. And it's happened to be shaped like a fish, which, it was laid out by an NRCS person, but it's kind of cool that it's kind of fish shaped. And he says, you know, this is one of the, because we take, we had grand, we had, I had kids by then, and so the grandkids, he takes the kids up there every day when they're there. He says, you know, I really didn't like this, this whole idea, because I worked my entire life to get this thing drained so we farm it and make money on it. And you just mess it up. He says, this really is quite a project. He said, I really like it. So, I mean, it changed his mindset. And so um, I talk about changing mindsets, you know, and until he saw what you could actually do, it, it, you know, it changed his mindset. So an unprofitable piece of ground, low ROI return on it. It was proven by technology. We made it change. And now we, my wife and I take the dogs up there, not through the wintertime, but every day, and they have to go for a swim. And, you know, it's just a great place. I got a honey beehives up there now, and it's just kind of been a cool little place. So now there's that's the water area. So, and then I want to talk quickly about the Leica farm. So the Leica farm, and I uh, uh, actually help manage the the farm and some of the things that go on there. So this was an old picture in 2005 when we bought the farm. Uh, this is a Google Map picture of it today. So the Leica farm. Um, it's open pretty much, I, sh I shouldn't say you're around, but it's got, a, it's got a nice trail around the whole thing. We have signage. It has every conservation practice known to man in one 80-acre location. It's just east of Melbourne. It has um, a rain garden. It has, uh, it has saturated bu two saturated buffers. It has bioreactors. It has sediment basins. It has um, several grass waterways, several um, different types of terraces, a CREP, a Conservation Reserve Enhancement Wetland, 
And now if we just finish with the deep water pond, I wish the video worked because it's really, it, it's uh, Sean Richmond did it for us and it's a cool flyover. It's about a one minute flyover the entire farm and, and uh, I could get it for him, but we'll move on. But anyway, so um, the farm is a great showcase for anyone who would like to just stop and say, hey, you know, I'd like to see a crap or I'd like to see what does a, what does a, um, a saturated buffer look like? We actually um, put it in last year. We installed it. We had group there. I kept the water back and we left the trench open and showed exactly what that looks like. Right, Ben? And it was kind of neat to see the water filling the trench and how that's going to saturate that, that area. So a little bit, uh, this is kind of a, getting close to my end of my um, slide. So I just, I talk a little bit about the nutri Iowa nutrient strategy because this whole thing fits in the strategy. You know, the strategy says we got to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, 41% nitrogen, 29, 30% phosphorus reduction. We're doing, you know, we've made a lot of strides on phosphorus. I think the nitrogen is going to be the key. You know, so the thing that I grab off this slide is the four R's is where, that's where we're going we're to have the practices that we can put in place. Uh, land use practices and edge field practices, that's going to be our key going in the future of where we're going to need to concentrate to meet this strategy. Um, so, I've talked about it enough, but we need to start the discussion. And discussion happens with you and the farmer. Not only nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, but also discussion on conservation. And second to the last slide, I use this a lot, but water quality starts on my farm. This picture on the left is a picture of uh, my wetland, and because this guy's a great picture of frog. The other side is the Mississippi River. My goal is to get 100% of the stakeholders to do something. Something, a change. There's no silver bullet with conservation. What works on my farm may not work everywhere. And with that, I can take questions. We may be able to, yeah, we'll try to, We'll take questions and we'll see if we can't get uh, our little our little video to work. It should work, but if not, I can. It is. Are you on desktop? Presentation. I'm on this. Yeah, probably. Not. So, questions about presentation today? Did I pique anybody's interest, or have you got any questions about what I said? Yeah, right there. I've been to the Life of Farm. I'm curious. Are you taking any research data that would tell us? What that stuff is worth yep. as a benefit? Yep, we are. Uh, Iowa State has two monitoring hubs there. One before the water comes into our farm, and one as it leave, leaves the crack uh, wetland, the, the, the structure that we put in about five years ago. Um, you're not the first person to say, we need to publish that data because we're bringing in nutrient-rich water and it, when it leaves our farm, it is less. That's, that's the overall, that's the overall, uh, what I know. I don't know the exact numbers as far as average nitrogen that comes into our, wet, into our farm and what leaves. So, but yes, according to Iowa State, we are getting huge reductions because we have practices on top of practices. We have a, a crep wetland that we are actually putting saturated buffers and bioreactors before it even gets into that. So we're protecting the pile water before it even dumps into the CREP. The CREP already does its job by holding water and, and keeping it, uh, no, maybe it won't do it. I guess it's, it's wanting to play it off the internet. Oh, that's why. Oh, I'm, so if I go to, so if we go to the internet, do we get a signal? Do we have a door? Uh, is there a, oh, not hooked up. He's got up. So, does that, and I'll tell you the crep, I know for, uh, according to Sean, so that crep wetland was about a $150,000 project. It's got a hundred year uh, life. According to Sean, and this is numbers he ran, each, that crep removes, and he had, I don't remember the numbers are off the bat, Ben, I don't know, maybe you remember, but there was a number, but it, it was, when, for what you want to know is, 20, it costs, to build that crap and have it run for 100 years, it costs 26 cents. It costs 26 cents a pound to remove nitrogen 
every year. So if you're going to remove a pound of nitrogen, that cost of that structure is 26 cents. Nitrogen today is, you know, it fluctuates, so it's all, you know, 30 to 50 cents, let's just say. It's, so we are removing, we're removing um, the nitrogen with the structure for less. In. More questions. Keep taking them. So who owns the Lake Park? It's owned by the Leica members. It's owned by the association. And where we're at today with that farm is so just a little history. We would like to we would take and we would, uh, every two years we would have field days there. We'd, have our, we'd ask our associates to bring in all the machinery that they could help us with a project. We would do it, but they brought the machinery in. They brought us the biggest, best, nicest stuff you can imagine. We got to go up and you know, run stuff that you normally don't run your operation. Off-road trucks, excavators, cats, all of the latest technology. <laughs> yeah. Well now we're, we're completely, we're basically done with the farm. We have, we can't put another, we cannot put another conservation practice there. It's 100% it's tiled. It's a, it's, it's got every structure you can imagine. So we just, so now we're looking at what are we going to do for our field days? Well, we got some little small projects we can do, but um, to have the big projects, and I kind of got to go back because when we started in 2005, we were just doing it to, so we owned our own sandbox to play with. That was our whole reason. Now, we have, um, it, for the last, you know, what, 14 years, we've been creating this thing that we just do for a living. We didn't know, we didn't think about the water quality <laughs> aspects of this farm. Because that wasn't our, we were just wanting to run machinery and build structures, the things that most of the guys in our association do every day. Here's the one, here's the little short video I'll be able to play. Let's see. <clears throat> I always like those videos, it's always a problem. So, so, somebody had a vision that it was more than just putting structures on the ground. It actually is going to have some value of water quality. So, anyway, other questions while we're trying to, really like, I could probably run into, I could run it. I have an email with it too, that could be. We found the right, you just put your planner. Okay, so on my operation, <laughs> since we're doing 15 inch rows, I'm using 28 to 32 pounds of rye. Using a rye disc with a vacuum planner, a 1790 John Deere planner with a ride disc, and that's what you saw those pictures there. That's 32 pounds of ride. We're think we continue to try to even tweak it down farther because, in my mind, if we can get ride planted with seed to soil contact, because I tried it all different ways, I spun it on top in 12 and 13. Well, guess what? 12 and 13 was two of the driest falls we ever had. Spent a lot of money, spun it on top, nothing grew. Nothing. Tell, actually, I shouldn't say that. When the pickers came through, it had rained by then, and where the pickers came, they actually, uh, it looks like it's getting there. It's kind of getting there. Okay. So, um, we decided that we have to drill it. We have to some way incorporate it. I think you can put it on, I can think you can put it ahead of a vertical fill machine. You gotta get seed to soil contact. That's, that's farming 101. We forgot that. We thought you could just spread seeds on top of the ground and, and it would work, but it it doesn't. You have to have seed to soil contact to get the seed in right. Rye will grow on just about everything, but it's, it's gotta have moisture and it's gotta have seed to soil contact. And then we terminate with, uh, in the spring, with 44 ounces of Roundup. I mean, we kind of hit a problem, but we never have a problem terminating it. We use uh, two ounces of pyrethroid, and we actually still um, use something for a pre with it at, at termination. That's been our program. I'd, I'd like to be able to get where I'm not putting the pre on because we get such great weed control with, um, with rye. There we go. That's all right. That's good. That's good. We don't need the sound. It's just, that sound is just kind of 
So there's just kind of going from north to south. So we're we're starting or from south to north, I should say. We're starting down by the, the newest project at the pond. We got buffers on both sides. And this video just takes us through kind of the heart of the farm. And there's our um, there's the bioreactors on this side. There's where we walk, we monitor water. There's our crop. There's a couple of terraces up there. Um, so in this guitar, I'll tell you kind of how the water goes through this whole thing. It's kind of neat. And we do got a 60 by 80 uh, machine shed there also. It's made up. So all that hard work for that. <laughs> So let me take you back to that picture I had of it. Well, so it's kind of these pointers work on this thing by chance? It will if I plug that in. Oh, there you go. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So north and south. So this our our deep water pond is here now. So you can see. This is how our, um, this is how, it's kind of just a meandering stream here. The water comes in from the top. It actually flows into these two wetlands. The overflow goes here. Pipes from one wetland to the other, then it's piped to this, the crep. And then it goes through this structure. This is where the uh, bioreactor is. The water is coming from Melbourne, comes into here. It, runs down through kind of, this is a wetland area now, and then it goes to the deep water pond and out. So what I, what I explain it as, is this is an agricultural water treatment facility. And you think about water treatment in the cities. So what do they do? So your, your stuff goes into a one area holding pond, sediment, solids fall out, right? And then they move it to another one where they clarify it again through another um, through another pond. That's exactly what we're doing here. When we bought this farm, this was just stream just went from here and zigzagged around to there. I don't know how long it took water to get down there, but it didn't take long when we had big rainfalls. It would shoot from one end to the other very quickly. Yeah, the pond is or the, the stream is doesn't seem like a lot of water until you. Um, until you have a field day when you get eight inches of water before you're digging a pond, then it seems like a lot of water. But it's, it, it actually doesn't, it isn't flowing a lot of water. But this is just an example of what we can do in Iowa that's out there and available for either cost share, design work. I mean, it, it's available. And so um, we continue to farm maybe smaller parts because with <coughs> this crap, you can see the buffer around it that we actually included in the program. So if we go to the next picture up where we started, I don't know if that's a great picture, but you can see maybe uh, they might have farmed, this looked like it was grass, they might have farmed that, they farmed this right there, which is now our building, and they farmed this whole side. I'm not sure we removed a lot of the available farm ground out. What we did is just turned it into a farm that actually reduces the amount of nutrients that come in from the top, or that the water's cleaner when it leaves our farm than when it goes out. Other questions? I know we got about 10 minutes probably before we... You got a question, John? <laughs> I brought my wife with me today because it's such a treacherous drive that, and we have grandkids in town, so. Yeah, two reasons. Jeff. Tim, after you did this as many years, what do you think the land value is that you put structure? I mean, if your acre per acre tillage is the same, do you think you improved the ground that you are farming for yields? I, well, yield wise, I think we are because we've, um, when we started farming this thing, there was a lot of, there was no little or no grass waterways. When water ran, even though it's very hilly topography, you, you saw a lot of soil movement. 
unlike what I'm used to as a flatlander, when we dug this pond out, so we dug it out, uh, I think we had to go down about six feet. We never got it, we never got into clay. It was black dirt all the way. The whole time we're digging, I'm like, is that right? Because you're Northeast Iowa, you dig a pond, you're gonna take off two foot of black, and then you're into clay. There was never, we never hit clay. The cool thing about this is all the dirt that came out here went up on top of our hilltops. Now they wanted to, you know, contractor guys wanted to sell it. I said, hey, you're selling dirt, farmer. You're not selling that. We're gonna keep it, we're gonna put it on top where we need And so we, we had all these off-road trucks and we covered, covered hills. And uh, it was beautiful black dirt, which is amazing to me. So that's the difference between flatline here and somebody that's so we never, never got the clay. Never seen clay on this farm yet. Probably on top of the hills, I shouldn't say that. You see clay on top of the hills. So, to answer the question, I think the value, of course, you know, in 2005 land was cheaper, yeah. but I think the value of this, what the structure's on, be right next to it. Yeah. Should, should be just as valuable as that. And, we're, and the other thing we've done, too, which is kind of helpful, don't know all the neighbors on both sides of us, but since we've started putting projects in and we have people out there, we're seeing more and more projects being done at our borders. Um, you can't see in this picture, but there's a wetland even above on the neighbors. There's a pretty good sized pond up north of us, so the guy's doing some work. Um, this, this is our borders here and here. Um, these used to not be there and now we got grass waterways that are helping. So as we put structures in, we start getting the neighbors to, to put structures in to ours. Good question. Those are deep water bottom and cold water. It holds water great. There's no place. Nope. Yeah, exactly. So as a guy <laughs> that thinks about ponds, you would think that you need clay to seal it up. I guess you don't. Now that we get down to it, it's black. Maybe it's got, maybe it looks like black dirt, but it holds water great. It holds water great. You wouldn't think it, you wouldn't think it, because we, uh, we didn't, you know, we went down not any more than uh, digging out probably six feet, six to eight feet places. Never saw clay. The only place I saw they had to get clay and had to dig down really deep is because there was a, fairly large structure on the bottom that needed a clay to fill for, for holding and they took a bunch out. But most of this digging up into here was all black. Other questions? So because of the cost of the structures, how are you going to convince farmers that this is necessary? God, that's a great question. <laughs> The cost is, I mean, it's, the crap is $150,000. That's, that's a cost. And how do you recoup that? That's your question. How does the farmer, I mean, how can he go and afford to put in a saturated buffer, uh, a crap, um, grass waterways? How are you going to recoup it? How do you recoup the cost? Well, some of it, luckily, we do have some really decent cost share programs that help, that help do that. Um, the crap, they're a little, that's more, money's a little harder, it's a little bigger, bigger, bigger project. Um, I'm not sure if I have a great answer to you. You stuck me. Well, if, if you, they don't start incorporating these for soil health, for water quality health. Regulation. <coughs> regulation will force us to. You already knew the answer, didn't you? To <laughs> 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 These acres, um, since we rent out the acres, so this, we rent, when we don't have field days, we keep this grassed all the time, this is grassed all the time. The only acres we rent, well we, the only acres we rent out is this, and this, and this when it's not a field day. So it, it stays in a lot of grass. Um, the renter does not use cover crops. We don't require him to. Um, that's the next step as we start looking at this is, and 
I haven't had that conversation. There's another guy that kind of handles the taking care of the renter, and we're just happy to have somebody that comes in and farms and, and make sure that when we have a field day that we're not mucking up their farming. So we're just tickled that we can get someone in that can uh, uh, take care of the acres. We mow, we, we keep the stuff looking pretty, but the farmer does a great job, and we just didn't make it a requirement. You gotta put cover crops on it. So we don't have cover crops on the row crop acres, but everything else is grass. Other questions? If not, I'd say that we're getting close. If you have any other questions, I'm gonna be here for a while, but appreciate your um, attendance and your working through our technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you.